Hello there, I'm Steve from Mac84 and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be looking at the RAS SCSI, a Raspberry Pi powered SCSI hard drive emulator for vintage Macintosh computers. This device is pretty unique and it has its own pluses and minuses when you compare it to things like the Blue SCSI or the SCSI 2SD. Today we're going to be setting up this RAS SCSI and seeing how it works and then we're going to look into some of the experimental Ethernet functionality which I think is really cool. While this is kind of a tutorial video, I would strongly suggest you follow alongside with the project setup guide linked in the video description, as this is an ever evolving project. It'll be clear from this video that I'm only a novice Raspberry Pi enthusiast, but hopefully this shows you that if I could do it, so could you. Before we get started, I want to mention that my friend Sean from the Action Retro YouTube channel also made a video about his Raspberry experience, so go and check out his video and subscribe to his channel as well. I'll put a link in the video description. The Raspberry is a solution to solve the age-old vintage Mac problem of replacing a dead or missing SCSI hard drive. The issue, of course, is that vintage Macintosh computers commonly use the SCSI interface for their hard drives. Unlike most PCs, which use the cheaper, more common IDE or ATA interface for their hard drives. With IDE, there are cheap and plentiful compact flash or SD card IDE adapters. But on the SCSI and Macintosh side of things, we were left with hoarding old server hard drives, zip disks, and buying convoluted SCSI cables and adapters just so our Macs could boot. Old hard drives don't last forever, so thankfully we do have some better options these days. I'm continually blown away by the amazing work people have been putting into creating these modern SCSI hard drive replacements. They really do breathe new life into your old Mac, and it's so exciting to look at some of these solutions today. The RAS SCSI, as its name implies, is a two-piece solution that uses a Raspberry Pi to connect to a SCSI computer, like a vintage Mac or a PC. The RAS SCSI hardware connects to a compatible Raspberry Pi computer via its GPIO connector. The RAS SCSI adapter has a 50-pin SCSI port and a 25-pin DB connector to connect to your vintage computer SCSI port. The RAS SCSI can then emulate multiple SCSI devices, like a hard drive or multiple hard drives, to your vintage computer. Your vintage Mac is blissfully unaware it's using an emulated hard drive. For all it knows, it's connected to a loud, spinning box of rust. The project began in Japan, sometime around 2016, by Gimmins. They had developed it to emulate SCSI devices for their Sharp X68000 computer. A fork was made of the project in 2020, and all of the documentation and source code was painstakingly translated from Japanese to English by Tony and a group of awesome individuals to create the RAS SCSI we know today. Since the RAS SCSI relies on the Raspberry Pi to work, getting it to go from scratch can be a bit more involved than the other emulators out there. However, this is of course early days. I have no doubt that these processes will improve and make things even easier in the future. Plus, some of the fine folks at the Open Retro SCSI Discord server were more than happy to answer my relentless barrage of newbie questions around the clock. My most sincere apologies to Eric, Tom, and Tony. <laughs> but seriously, thank you very much for your help. It was greatly appreciated. For comparison, let's take a very brief look at a few of the other open source SCSI emulators out there. The Blue SCSI is one of the newcomers in this arena. The value is spectacular, and it works great on a growing number of 68K and even PowerPC based Macs. It's a little board that uses an Arduino blue pill and has a micro SD card to emulate a SCSI hard drive. For about $25 or $30 in a solder it yourself kit, or about $50 assembled, it's an affordable way to replace a hard drive in a vintage Mac. It also requires little to no configuration, letting you drag and drop a virtual hard drive image onto an SD card and you have your Mac booted up in minutes. The SD card for the device is FAT32 or XFAT formatted, letting you pop this little card into your modern PC or Mac and drag and drop new hard drive images onto it easily. The SCSI 2SD comes in many flavors, and the functionality differs between them. It's aimed at more than just vintage Macs, so you'll need to configure it specifically to work with a Mac. It also uses an SD card for data storage, but that SD card is formatted for the host system. So if you're using it on a vintage Mac, that SD card is formatted with the older Macintosh OS standard or HFS file system, meaning copying files to and from the system may require use of an older Mac running Mac OS X 10.5 Leopard or earlier. Some older models of the SCSI 2SD are open source, so you can build your own, but you can order models online that are pre-assembled and a bit newer. The cost of these vary greatly depending on the model, but expect to spend upwards of $75 each. And now, the lovely raw SCSI. I bought mine back in February 2021, and it cost me about $50 shipped. 
This was with an add-on SCSI daisy chain adapter and this lovely magnet. Today, it looks like a do-it-yourself assembly kit costs about $30 and a pre-assembled kit costs about $65, not including shipping. This isn't a bad price, but do keep in mind if you don't already own a compatible Raspberry Pi, you will need to spend a bit more, plus a power adapter, a micro SD card, and some other essentials. A list of compatible Raspberry Pi models are provided on their GitHub and Wiki page. You can find links to these in the video description. I'm using a Raspberry Pi Model 2. It's not the latest and greatest, but it's what I had available. So why did I purchase a RAS SCSI if I already had other modern SCSI emulators? Well, I have quite a few vintage Macs, so I'm always up to trying a modern SCSI hard drive emulator and seeing how it works out. Secondly, this one has some really cool features. Since the RAS SCSI uses a Raspberry Pi, it can do some pretty advanced things. One handy feature is a built-in web server. This provides a web interface for managing your RAS SCSI and its virtual hard drive images. This allows you to configure things right from your web browser with a nice user interface. It even lets you send downloaded files like software from Macintosh Garden and mount them as a disk image on your Mac desktop. The interface makes it easier than remoting into your Pi via SSH and remembering which configuration file to change and the proper syntax needed, etc. The second feature is something very cool, and in my opinion, the killer app of the RAS SCSI. SCSI to Ethernet emulation. Yes, you heard that right. An experimental build of the RAS SCSI software allows it to emulate the popular DanaPort SCSI Link hardware adapter. A few similar solutions were sold during the 1990s. These adapters are getting harder to find and quite expensive, so it's absolutely stunning that they could be emulated with the RAS SCSI. But what would you need a SCSI to Ethernet adapter for? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the vintage early Macs had little or limited expandability options, and until the Power Macintosh series, most of them didn't have built-in Ethernet connectivity. For example, the Macintosh Plus and Classic don't have any expansion slots, and the Macintosh SE, SE30, Color Classic, and LC series only have one PDS expansion slot. So if you already had a CPU or FPU upgrade installed, or maybe an Apple IIe card, you used up that one expansion slot, and you couldn't install a network card. So since SCSI is a flexible interface, kind of like a vintage Thunderbolt, it could be used for external storage devices, video imaging devices, scanners, and even Ethernet adapters. With Ethernet connectivity on your vintage Mac, you could connect to other Macs on the network, share printers and devices, and even browse the web like it's 1995. Speaking of which, the RAS SCSI's web interface is designed to even load on older versions of web browsers like Netscape, so you can configure it right from the old Mac that it's being used on. Pretty cool. Although I'm very excited, I must stress that the SCSI to Ethernet bridge emulation is strictly experimental. It's very early days, but it is promising. Although you can put in some extra work and use Wi-Fi instead of Ethernet on your Pi, assuming it has Wi-Fi, today I'm going to stick with Ethernet, which is a bit more straightforward to set up. Again, the RAS SCSI project is currently in development, so some of the issues I've encountered today have already been resolved, and there may be corrections appearing on the screen. So check out the RAS SCSI links in the video description to get the most up-to-date information. Since I bought the solder at yourself kit of the RAS SCSI, I needed to assemble it. You can catch my live stream of this process in the video linked above and in the video description. Next, I need to set up a Raspberry Pi computer. I used a blank 8GB microSD card, which should be fine for now. I then used my Mac to download the Pi OS image from the Raspberry Pi website. I chose the Raspberry Pi OS with desktop, but you can install the light version to save on disk space and resources. I then wrote the Pi OS image to the blank SD card, and when it was done, I put the SD card in my Pi. I connected my RAS SCSI adapter to the Pi's GPIO header, and then connected my monitor, keyboard, mouse, and Ethernet cables. Finally, I connected the power cable and booted up my RAS SCSI device. On the Pi, I ran its initial setup, and then it was time to add the RAS SCSI software. Even for a novice like me, this wasn't too difficult. Just ensure that your Pi is connected to the internet and follow the instructions on the RAS SCSI setup page. Again, stick to the instructions on that page because even during the filming of this video, things have been updated and refined. Partially thanks to me for stumbling through some of these steps. First, you need to install Git. Then, you need to clone the RAS SCSI repository to your Pi from the internet. And then, you need to run a script that handles the rest. This easy install script gives you a few options. I chose the first one because it makes a blank 600 megabyte hard drive image for you. After the script had finished, I rebooted the Pi and confirmed that the raw SCSI service was running. Now it was time to turn my attention to my vintage Mac. The Mac I'm using today is a Macintosh LC3. 
it wasn't too happy when I started filming, so I had to perform an unscheduled recap to get it back into shape. These systems also don't like behaving without a good PRAM battery, and having none of them on hand, I soldered up a battery holder and improvised with two AA batteries. Yes, Bruce, I know what you're going to say. Just buy a new battery. Yes, yes, I will, but I think it's fine for now. I wanted to see if this Mac would recognize the ROS SCSI, so I used my SCSI 2SD adapter, connected externally, to act as my startup volume on the Mac. This would let me set up and format the ROS SCSI hard drive without booting from floppies. Alternatively, you could upload a pre-made virtual hard drive image into the RAS SCSI's images folder on the Pi's SD card, but I want to approach this as if the RAS SCSI was a blank hard drive. However, with the RAS SCSI connected to the internal SCSI bus, my Mac didn't see its newly created virtual hard drive image. And that's although because the easy install creates a 600 megabyte hard drive image for you, it does not attach it for you. Without the action of attaching the disk, the virtual disk image is not usable. So I ran this command to attach that drive image. Running another command showed me that the drive was now connected. You could also use the web interface to perform these same tasks. Then I restarted my Mac. I went to format the drive using Apple's SCHD setup, but it couldn't find the disk. And although Mount Everything crashed when I launched it, if we look closely, it did detect the hard drive on the SCSI bus. So let's try Hard Disk Toolkit version 2. All right, great. It sees the drive, so let's try and format it. Yeah, no, it didn't like it. Even allocating more memory to the application and even turning on virtual memory seemed to have no effect. In between fussing around, I did switch from my SCSI 2SD as a boot drive to my blue SCSI. Just because my SCSI 2SD was getting a bit cranky, I think I need to reformat that SD card. Well, anyway, I tried to format the RAS SCSI hard drive again with the patched version of the Apple SDHD setup program. Many folks use this patched version for their SCSI 2SD adapters, as it allows you to format hard drives that weren't shipped by Apple. Now, although it did format the disk, it took its sweet time doing so, and it only resulted in a tiny 20 megabyte partition out of the 600 megabyte hard drive image. This is because the Apple program sees the vendor information of the hard drive and assumed it was only a 20 megabyte hard drive. Now, I could fuss with this, but I had a better idea. Hard Disk Toolkit Personal Edition 1.5 worked great for my blue SCSI, so hopefully it'll work here. And there we go, it formatted the disk without a problem. Now that my RAS SCSI hard drive image was properly formatted, it was time to copy my Macintosh System 7.1 installation from my blue SCSI to my RAS SCSI, including that pesky system enabler that we need for this Macintosh LC3. So now let's unplug the blue SCSI and reboot. Uh, what the heck? Oh. One thing I did notice was that every time I restarted or turned off my raw SCSI during this process, I had to reattach the SCSI hard drive image. Thankfully, this can be fixed by editing the raw SCSI service configuration, telling it to mount the disk at a specified SCSI ID whenever the Pi starts the raw SCSI service. This way, we won't have to do that manually again. I've rebooted the Pi to see if those changes took effect. Running this command shows me that the disk image is now connected. You can manually attach these images via the web interface, but configuring the service to always attach the drive on startup saves me a step. Now that everything works, let's push it one step further. I want to test this amazing Dana port SCSI to Ethernet bridge emulation. I started following the instructions on the wiki, but I got confused. Thankfully, Tom, Tony, and Eric on the Open Retro SCSI Discord server were there to guide me and keep me from acting too stupid. They actually provided me with an easier set of instructions that I'll show you here. The Rascuzzi software has a few branches, including one that offers experimental features like the Dana port SCSI to Ethernet bridge. So this meant that I needed to reinstall the Rascuzzi software using one of those different branches. During my setup, this branch was called Dana port 3. However, since then it has been changed to develop, so keep that in mind. I navigated to the Rascuzzi directory and then I checked out the Dana port 3 branch. Again, this branch is now called develop. Refer to the documentation on their website for the most up-to-date information. I then reran the easy install script and selected option 3. This compiled the software for the RAS SCSI again, but thankfully retained my previously created 600 megabyte virtual hard drive image. About 18 minutes later, the install was finished. Now I needed to configure the Pi's network interface to play nice with the Dana port emulation. Since I was using a wired Ethernet setup, my steps may differ from yours, but just follow the instructions on the wiki and you should be fine. 
After configuring the dhcpd.com file, I rebooted the Pi. Then, I confirmed the status of everything with these commands, and comparing them to the wiki, I was in good shape. The final thing I had to do was tell the RAS SCSI to always enable the emulated Dana port device and attach it to SCSI ID 1. As of this recording, there are a few bugs with using multiple SCSI IDs on the RAS SCSI. However, the specific configuration of using a hard drive set to SCSI ID 0 and the Dana port adapter set to SCSI ID 1 works fine. I was very excited to play around with my RAS SCSI adapter and its newly enabled Ethernet functionality but I really wanted to also update the OS on my LC3 to something besides 7.1. Don't get me wrong, 7.1 is great on this machine, but I wanted to see how a later machine ran. And since we're dealing with virtual hard disk images, if something really blew up, I could easily revert back to an earlier disk. My plan was to create a new hard drive image on the popular Mac emulator Basilisk 2 on my modern Mac and send the hard drive image over to the RAS SCSI and have it on my Mac LC and boot up from it. But I ran into a problem. The Raskuzzi's web interface wouldn't upload my 500 megabyte hard drive image. Thankfully, this is a known bug with larger files, and the team is already working hard to fix it. But since the Pi is, well, a Pi, you can FTP or SMB files over to it easily, and that's exactly what I did. But after configuring and attaching my Basilisk hard drive image, I encountered a second problem. The partition map data from my new hard drive image was not happy on a real Mac, and it was prompting me to erase it. So on to plan B. I decided to make a copy of my working Ross SCSI 600 megabyte hard drive image to my Mac with Basilisk 2 and install System 7.5 as an upgrade in an emulated environment to save on time. Unfortunately, me being half asleep while doing this, I mixed up which drive image was what and got very confused. When I copied things back to the Pi, I was stunned to find that the hard drive image still had 7.1 on it. It wouldn't be until the next day that I figured out what I did wrong. So what did I do next? Did I go to sleep? No. And what idea did my sleep-deprived Macintosh maniac brain think of? Stick to the tried and true old way of doing things. External CD-ROM drive. Check. SCSI cables and terminator. Check. Original Apple install CD. Check. After all, how long could a full install of System 7.6 on a Macintosh LC3 actually take? That was much longer than I expected. Uh, so where do we leave off? Ah, yes, so let's hobble over the finish line. To get the Dana port working correctly, we need some software. My install of macOS 7.6 included OpenTransport 1.0, which is a suite of networking software and drivers from Apple. It replaces the clunky old Mac TCP software and gives you the ability to do fancy things like DHCP. So generally speaking, OpenTransport is the way to go. However, it could use an update. So we're going to install OpenTransport 1.3, something that in my past live streams have been a very unforgiving process. The reason being that my particular download of OpenTransport 1.3 seemingly refuses to install on my Mac for the silliest of reasons. It gets confused. Even if everything is in plain sight, it complains that it can't find the files to install the software and is looking for a disk. Granted, this doesn't happen on some machines, but it happened on this one. The problem is, version 1.3 wasn't widely available and isn't included on any System 7 install disk, so the version on MacintoshGarden.org is all I could find. But during another round of bashing my head against a desk during a live stream, I made a discovery. A comment on the Macintosh Garden page provided a clue. The software preferred to be decompressed on the exact system and hard drive volume you were going to install it on. This may seem like common sense, but since I have a network of file sharing enabled Macs, I often copy files around the network. And if my Power Mac G4 or Quadra has stuff at Expander installed, for you non Mac folk, that's a decompression utility like WinRAR, I may decide to decompress that file on the faster machine before passing along the uncompressed files to my target machine over the network. Because decompressing on an old machine can be so slow. And this was seemingly causing that problem. So let's test this theory. So let's install Stuff It and I'm going to decompress my open transport file right on this volume. It's working! Really? Really? I'm so glad to finally have a solution to this. My MacEck friends are very tired about me complaining about this, so I'm very glad that this is finally solved. Gladly restart. 
To go one step further, I did help Eric on the Open Retro SCSI Discord channel test a set of Open Transport 1.3 disc images that he made as an alternative to that Moody installer. Thankfully, these worked great, so hopefully nobody will have to deal with this type of frustration again. Next, we need a Danaport driver on our Mac to use the emulated Danaport network bridge. The Roscuzzy wiki tells us to use version 7.5.3 of this software. What? And what do you know, this installer is picky too. First off, if you're following this guide, and if you are, good luck to you, and you see this screen, it means that your Mac can't see the Danaport adapter. It may not be attached to your SCSI bus, so check your configuration on your Roscuzzy and try again. Secondly, if you launch the installer from your startup disk, it complains that it can't be run. I found this odd at first, but I soon understood why. The installer includes a version of Apple Share for System 6 and System 7, so if you don't have any Apple Share networking software on your Mac, it would install it for you. But thanks to our open transport friend, we don't need any of that, and accidentally installing this old version of stuff could throw us for a loop. So first we need to trick the installer into running. Putting the installer on a disk that is not our startup disk should do the trick. I'm going to use disk copy 6 to make a virtual floppy disk image, which should be treated by the Mac the same as a real floppy disk. Now let's try running that installer again from our virtual disk. Awesome, it's no longer giving us that error. I'll be sure to post this disk image on the Roscuzzy wiki so it'll be easier for everyone. But we're not out of the woods yet. If you attempt to easy install, it'll stop abruptly because it can't overwrite some system files that the Mac is currently using. Which is good, we don't want to overwrite our newer stuff with the old stuff anyway. So instead, choose custom install. We only need to install the one driver file, and nothing else. So scroll down and select Danaport SCSI link, and then click install. Once it's done, reboot your Mac. Alright, let's reboot. Now it's time to test all of our hard work. I opened up the TCP IP control panel and was very happy to see a new alternate Ethernet option. The system was properly seeing our Danaport SCSI to Ethernet adapter. Yay! The Apple Talk control panel showed me the same, so I switched it to Ethernet to test it out. Now if I go to the chooser, look what we see. Our Mac Mini G4 on our Ethernet network. Lovely. But upon trying to connect, we get an error. But this is okay, I was expecting that. The final piece of the puzzle is an Apple Share Client Update version 3.8.3. This makes your Mac smart enough to understand the more modern Mac file shares, like those from Mac OS 8.5, 8.6, 9, and higher. Even all the way up to Mac OS 10.4 Tiger, like what's running on our Mac Mini. But with one final software install and a reboot of our Mac, we can finally connect to our Mac Mini over our network. This is beautiful. To close out this video, let's go for a stroll on the World Wide Web. I've always had a fondness for Netscape, and since I have the installer here, let's give it a go. Or, I guess not. It sat here for 5 minutes doing nothing, so let's try another version. I grabbed version 3.0.1 over the network, and it seemed to have liked that one. So let's test out Mac84.net. Yay! <laughs> Thank goodness! <laughs> wow, that was quite a journey. But look at us, we made it! We are on the internets! Browsing Netscape 3 brings back a lot of dial-up memories, but it's performing particularly zippy here. We can load up the retro version of Mac84.net, and even try out the beta vintage-friendly version of Macintosh Garden. Of course, no vintage web browsing would be complete without visiting 68k.news and FrogFind, created by my friend Sean of Action Retro. These websites are optimized for old machines, and they're really a treat to use. By the way, I know images take up a little bit of resources and such, but wouldn't you love to see this beautiful, fat, lazy, animated frog just grooving on the FrogFind website? Well, of course you would. I drew him on a whim, and I think all vintage computers across the world need to experience his magic. So make it happen, Sean. The world demands it. Well, I hope you enjoyed my adventures in Roscuzzy land today. It was very exciting to explore this new device, especially its web interface features, and that SCSI to Ethernet emulation. If you want to get one for yourself, check out the links in the video description to learn more. I'm sure this won't be the last time I look into this Roscuzzy device, so stay tuned for future videos featuring this product. 
Again, a huge shout out goes to all the folks on the Open Retro SCSI Discord channel for their help in making this video. Thank you. If you like these sorts of videos, please consider subscribing to the channel. And don't forget to like the video as well. If you want to support my archiving efforts and these videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, you get exclusive access to early videos and behind the scenes goodies you can't get anyplace else. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram. My handle is Mac84TV. But that's about it for now. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you right here next time on Mac84.